Welcome everyone to today's ICAS Insights webinar towards sustainability reporting standards, what we can learn from global financial reporting standards. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anna Drain and I'm Head of Sustainability and Reporting at ICAS and it's a pleasure to be your host for this session today. The plan is that the session will last roughly an hour and a half um, and that will include around 40 minutes for an informal panel discussion amongst our three speakers, followed by around 30 minutes for audience Q&A. I do just need to run through a couple of housekeeping issues. You, Those of you who have attended any previous ICAST webinars will be familiar with the, the disclaimer that's on your screen. Um, I won't run through it in detail, but just to highlight that the views of the speakers are not necessarily the views of ICAS itself. A couple of housekeeping issues. Um, there is a button, on the, or a button on the bottom of your screen for live Q&A and I would encourage you to post any questions for our presenters um, at any point during the discussion in that button. There's also a discussion forum. Um, so if you have any comments that you want to share, based on what you've heard from our, our speakers, then, then please feel free to, to post them in this box. <clears throat> so I would like to introduce our, our speakers, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be delighted by three such distinguished um, panellists for the session today. Um, we have Professor Carol Adams, who will be chairing the discussion this morning with Sir David Tweedy and Professor Mervyn King. So. All three of these um, people have very um, impressive CVs and summarising them in a, a couple of sentences really won't do it justice, but I, I will try to, to, to do so. So starting with Carol, Carol is an ICAS member and Professor of Accounting at Durham University Business School. Her work is concerned with the role of accounting and reporting in the relationships between business, society and the environment. She is immediate past chair of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, Stakeholder Council, and was until recently a member of ACC's Global Forum on Sustainability, as well as a member of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board Technical Working Group. She was a member of the International Integrated Reporting Council's Capitals Collaboration Group and co-authored the Capitals Background Paper for Integrated Reporting and she served as a technical expert in the development of impact standards for the Sustainable Development Goals by the UNDP, as well as a project advisor to the UK government's Implementation Task Force on Impact Investing. Moving on to Professor Mervyn King. Mervyn is a senior counsel and former judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. He is Professor Extraordinaire at the University of South Africa on Corporate Citizenship and Honorary Professor at the Universities of Pretoria and Cape Town, as well as a visiting professor at Rhodes. Mervyn is former Chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council, IIRC, and Chairman Emeritus of the Global Reporting Initiative. He's also a prolific writer and is an author of six books on governance, sustainability and reporting, the latest being The Healthy Company. And finally, but by no means least, and a familiar face to many of, of ICAS members and others in the audience is Sir David Tweedy. So David was educated in Ed at Edinburgh University and um, achieved a BCom in 1966 and a PhD in 1969. He qualified as a Scottish Chartered Accountant in 1972. Sir David was knighted in 1994 and awarded the International Federation of Accountants inaugural Gold Service Award in 2011 and was inducted into the Accounting Hall of Fame in 2013. He was former president of ICAS in 2012 to 2013 and was chairman of the International Valuation Standards Council from 2012 to 2019. He also chaired the Royal Household Audit Committee for the Sovereign Grant for which he was appointed CVO and was also chairman of the board of the trustees of Scottish Charities, Lucky House and the ICAS Foundation. Also a prolific author, he has published four books and 60, over 60 articles, lectures and contributions to books on financial reporting. 
So welcome to all of you. I will just give you a brief overview of the session. Um, today, the speakers will be exploring what has been learned from the development of financial reporting standards that could be helpful in the development of sustainability reporting standards. They'll be looking back at the position before globally accepted financial reporting standards were developed and then why they were considered necessary. And they'll also reflect on how successful these standards have been in driving greater, tra greater transparency and consistency and trust in financial information, as well as sharing their views on how reporting might evolve. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining us and I'm very much looking forward to what promises to be a, a fascinating discussion. So if I can now pass over to Carol, who will start the session's discussion. Thank you very much, Anne. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you both, Mervyn and David. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to start with a few questions um, for David and then 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 Mervyn and then and then bring you both in. And now, now David, I in my in my research for this, I saw you being described as a, a champion of integrity for in international financial reporting. And that, that was referring uh, particularly to your time as chair of the UK Accounting Standards Board. And, you know, I remember you coming to Glasgow University and talking to students and we were, you, you talked us through some of the process um, that you were, um, you were going through at the time uh, through the harmonisation uh, journey. And I wondered, what did you feel was compromised and won in that struggle um, to bring the US in particular in line with international accounting standards? And were you able to retain that integrity? Because uh, it was the US that were the, the was was that was the sort of difficulty, wasn't it, in, in, in getting them in getting on board. Everybody else seemed to fall in line. Well, good morning, everyone. Basically, the, there is an exceptionalism in the United States. It, it, it is an issue. Um, they, they don't like being told what to do by other people, and that certainly was a problem for the IESB. Going right back to the integrity issue, um, I think one of the issues for sustainability is catching the moment. Um, when we uh, were in the Accounting Standards Board in the UK, the issue then was abuse. There was huge abuses. Um, Acquisition accounting was a scam, phony provisions that weren't used and fed back into profits in later years, never came out of profits, just affected the goodwill figure. Uh, they, there was all sorts of issues that they were trying to disguise what was going on. I mean, the balance sheet was almost an optional extra. There was hardly anything on it. I mean, you used to see on the, the right hand side, there was uh, nothing left and the left hand side, there was nothing right. Uh, and it was just a, a off balance sheet, uh, phony acquisition scams. Um, there was many, many issues that were just not right. They weren't showing the economics, but it was the moment that people felt that it had gone too far uh, and the accounting standards board was set up. So we went on and the tide of disapproval of these schemes and it was quite easy. We spent most of our time knocking them out uh, and then we started going on to the building of where should accounting go thereafter. With ISB, the tide was uh, globalization. Um, but it started in a, a certain way that uh, I can see it starting in the sustainability area too, because many of us, uh, when we're looking at one country, also look overseas, what's going on there. And a group formed of the American Standard Setter, the Canadian, uh, the Australian and the UK, uh, called the G4. Uh, and we used to meet fairly regularly, but th the idea was let's bring our standards closer together. And uh, New Zealand joined us uh, later on, but as a former auditor, I didn't think the difference was material, so we kept the name G4. Uh, and basically, when we looked at uh, the issues, you could see that what we were deciding to do is perhaps we should write joint standards and each of us publish them. Well, that was a challenge to the ISC, and that probably led to the ISB, so at least they could control what was going on. But the, the impetus really came from the national standard setters. And when we've got all these various uh, groups, you know, integrated reporting that Mervyn chaired and uh, the Sustainability Standards Board and so on, I was delighted to see this statement of intent, you know, let's get together, because that's exactly what we did in the, the G4. 
get together and move forward. Now, you can't have a bigger flood tide for sustain sustainability and climate change than you have at the moment. It's huge. Now, you've got this conference next uh, month in Glasgow. This is the moment. And if you fluff it, it's going to, well, I say you, uh, if the world fluffs this, uh, it's going to be a real problem to get it back on track again. So this is exactly the moment for this all to happen. And it matters because um, you need a shared vision. And that's why I thought the uh, statement of intent was so useful. The G4 had a, a shared vision. If you have a, a diverse set of standards all over the world, um, people are going to play you off. I always remember listening to Shyam Sunder, who's an American academic, and he said, we should compete with standards and people will take the best. Well, you must think the world's composed of angels because that isn't what happens. It's a race to the bottom. And we had that in spades in the um, global financial crisis when values were tumbling and suddenly Europe discovered there was a rule in America that said you could switch to back to current uh, to cost in exceptional circumstances. Nobody had ever done it. But the EU started to put through laws to try and enable them to do it. And we had, well, what should we do? Our first attitude was let them do it then. Just let them do it. And then the SEC came on and said, you've got to stop them. Uh, at least require disclosure of what's happening, because otherwise the market's going to implode. Everyone knows these numbers as they add back the losses are not true. It'll spread across to the, the states and make the situation even worse. So we did control it. And, but we could show exactly what the profit should have been. But the issue is we've got to have a common standard. We've got to have a common vision, and, and then this will work. If you get that, you're in business. So coming back to financial reporting, the EU fourth and seventh directives made quite a significant difference, did they not? Because practices across Europe, certainly in consolidation, were, which was the seventh directive, were really very different. And the fourth directive brought the, the formats um, in line. Um, at what stage did that happen? That was, surely, um, that was surely a good thing, was it not? It was. Uh, it became a bit of an impediment internationally uh, because other people didn't have the fourth and seventh directive. Uh, and I remember very early on the European Commission saying to me, you must make sure these standards are based on these two directives. Uh, and I said, well, we can't because they're going to be based on Australian corporate law. And it's not <clears> ridiculous. And we said, well, that's what the Australians said when we said we'd base them on the fourth and seventh directive. So we just have to do what we can and try and bring the world together in many ways. But at least the directives are vague enough. They're not detailed. One of the real problems governments have if they try and enshrine detailed accounting or sustainability standards because the world moves on uh, and uh, then you've got to change the law. And that's a problem. Yeah, so my understanding was that the fourth and seventh directive actually did help a lot with harmonisation across Europe. Um, yeah, and so, but my understanding was that you know we um, we had this principles-based accounting approach, and the ISC had a a very principles-based accounting approach, and then um, in trying to bring FASB on board. Did we not lose some of those principles? Well, and 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 come to a more rules-based approach. Uh, I'm afraid we probably did. Uh, the I, I remember the big four firms asked us if we could show what a principle-based standard was like, and we went to uh, one of the meetings of the senior partners and we showed them a principle-based standard for leasing. It was four pages long, and basically it said uh, show the liability you've incurred by signing the lease contract and the rights to the asset you've obtained thereby, full stop. And we could put a little bit on about renewal options, but what else do you want? And I remember telling them, if you want um, a standard that will deal with 80% of the issues, we can do that in about 20 pages. If you want us to deal with 95% of the issues, you're up to 300. Uh, and that's, in a way, the profession gets the standards it deserves. And the US, uh, they have something like, what, over 10,000 pages of US GAAP. Uh, I for S is probably close to two, that's too many. And when you look at the British standards, they were very, very short, but they cleared up the mess. And I think part of the problem is uh, if you get uh, auditors who've got all the backbone of a chocolate eclair and uh, it won't challenge, uh, and then where does it say they can't do that? And the standard set of sticks in a rule, we're on a business. The same with the uh, interpretations committee. Every interpretation is a rule. 
And that's yeah. why we managed to do very, very few in my time at ISP. We wouldn't do them. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're having a convergence program and you're trying to converge 2,000 pages with 10,000, it's a mega problem. Uh, and that's mm. the issue. So is a principles-based approach not a preferred approach, would you not say, when you're trying to um, bring things together it and harmonise? It is. And uh, that's in a way when we had the convergence program with uh, FASB, the idea was we would converge on the principles. And the danger, mm. of course, was that uh, you get auditors and uh, C CEOs saying, well, this standard doesn't deal with this. We'll go to US GAAP and bring whatever they've got in. So it, it came in through the back door in many ways. And that's one of the troubles about not having a single set of standards. The US okay. would come to, um, you know, I was called into the office of the chief accountant at the SEC, along with Bob Hers, who was chairman of uh, FASB. And it was made clear they would like the convergence program over in 2011. The, U the US would switch to uh, IFRS in 2013. And then the global financial crisis hit and everybody hunkered down. So it was on the cards. The moment passed. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I had a feeling during that time that a lot was being compromised. A lot of effort was being made to bring uh, FASB in line with the International Accounting Standards Board standards. And did it really happen? Was it worth it? I guess am I, am I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to. In terms of the financial reporting, I, I'm talking about financial reporting now. Well, um, a lot of the standards were the same. You know, the, the ones we were developing later, leasing, revenue recognition, things like that, they, they were the same. But we had to face what was already there. And, and that was the, the big problem. And the, the attitude was different. When uh, we first started, uh, the attitude of the um, trustees of FASB were improve IFRS and adopt. Uh, towards yeah. the end, uh, nationalism came in and it was stall the process and preserve US GAAP. And had we known that was going to be the eventual outcome, we probably never would have got into the convergence program. Mm. Yeah, but that time was too late. Too and late, yes. The convergence program stopped. Um, a few years after I left. Yeah, unfortunate. Um, so you and you put a lot of effort in in your time into fixing profit management and and dealing with other forms of cheating. Can you tell us, uh, give us a couple of examples of the the sorts of things that you found there, the the sorts of cheating that you were really keen to stamp out in these in these roles heading the the UK and the International Accounting Standards Boards. Well, just a, a very simple example. One of the first we stamped out was, uh, you probably remember a few years ago, um, prior to the Accounting Standards Board, uh, goodwill was written off against reserves. So that was the preferred option in the standards. So you'd get a company would buy one there for 100 and let's say the uh, net assets were 55. Uh, so you have goodwill of 45. So it disappears off to reserve. The um, company was a, a complete duck and uh, they sell it uh, the following year for 65. And then they claim they made a profit of 10 because they've got 55 assets in the balance sheet mm. and they sell for 65, forgetting the goodwill that they'd already paid for. So we made them bring that back and show the loss. But it was a simple thing, but in fact, it led to a lot of issues. You had multi um When they bought a company, they would make all sorts of provisions for future losses, uh, for reorganizing it. And then the company didn't have future losses and wasn't reorganized. And they said, we don't need these provisions, so we'll bring them back into profit. Well, they never came out of profit. It was basically a acquisition adjustment, which just affected goodwill. And so they had um, some of them had three years profits tucked away in these provisions. So we banned all that. But it was huge, uh, massive changes. And off balance sheet financing, they could do everything. The um, uh, classic was the, the whiskey scam. And um, you'd get a... A distillery um, produces the stuff um, and you can't drink a, a one-year-old whiskey. If you do, you lose the, the bouquet, the flavour and your power of speech. So they keep the stuff for five years. And what they did was they would sell it to a bank and uh, the bank would have an option to put it back to the distillery at the price the bank paid for it, plus interest and normal lending rates over the period of the, um, the sale. And the distillery had a, a call option to call it back. 
and the lawyers would tell you it was a sale. Uh, the stock would disappear, uh, maybe a little profit appeared, and the whiskey never left the distillery, and the distillery paid the interest quarterly. It was a loan secured on stock, and that's what we made them show. And that's just a simple example, but uh, that's the sort of thing that was happening. Accounting was a farce. Mm. And, and Mervyn, you must have seen some similar examples of, of um, poor non-financial reporting, which is it, which is effectively cheating in a in, in a similar way. Well, different, but um, still cheating nevertheless. Um, do you have any um, examples of of that 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 come to your mind? Unfortunately, there are many examples, Carol of mm -hmm. uh, what's known as greenwashing, or as I yes. call it, green wishing, because <laughs> that, that's what the, the corporate leaders wish, that they don't actually state uh, what is actually happening. So, um, you know, this uh, question of sustainability reporting, which does impact on value, um, really started, um, you go back in the 1980s when um, the United Nations understood there was environmental degradation from the way companies were developing. And, uh, and the Brundtland Commission was formed under the chairmanship of the then Prime Minister of Norway. And it worked from 83 to 87, you will remember. And uh, well, certain David, David and I remember, Carol, you younger. <laughs> But uh, by 1987, um, they came out with a report after working with iconic companies and practitioners and academics um, with three pillars that um, they said that companies um, operate, but their activities and their product impacts on the environment, society and the environment. And they operate in that triple context. So you will remember John Elkington's triple bottom line. Well, there was never a reporting in a triple bottom line. But companies had always operated in the triple context of the economy, society, and the environment. And unfortunately, through um, Supreme Court judgments around the world, and uh, then finally uh, Milton Friedman's doctrine, um, people looked at companies operating as if it were, if they were merely in an economic bubble. And of course, it was not. They had, since the inception of the incapacitated artificial limited liability company, they had operated in the triple context of the environment, society, and the economy. And um, the it, they were having impacts on the economy and society, and of course, uh, economically. So, um, when uh, towards the end of the 20th century, we found through research, which was expedited because of the third industrial revolution of the computer age, that we'd reached ecological overshoot. And in the main, it was limited liability companies that were using natural assets faster than nature was regenerating and clearly not a modus operandi which was sustainable. And so we started thinking of value creation and we looked at the makeup of the market cap of companies and I'm talking in general terms around the world, moving into the 21st century, we saw that um, we looked at balance sheets um, we saw that the market cap of companies was only about 20% of value was being expressed as additives in a balance sheet according to the harmonized standards that David has been talking about. And um, what was making up the other 80%? Well, that became known as the sustainability issues now, ESG. And the GRI was formed, of which before that I was chair of the United Nations on Governance and Oversight. And that's where I really learned about sustainability issues at the beginning of the century. And then chair of the GRI. And what we focused on, you will remember, Carol, we focused on the impacts of the activities of a company 
how it, how it made its product or rendered its service and how its product or its service went out into the market space as an output. And there were other outputs such as waste. And these outputs had impacts which had outcomes. So we started looking at, at that, the impacts of a company's activities and its product on the economy, society, and the environment, the three pillars identified by Brundtland. But then there were events which impacted on the harmonization of financial standards and also impacted on any work trying to get harmonization in the ESG space. So the ESG space was becoming more and more important and consequently there were many framework providers and standard setters that developed. And in March 2019, I gave a speech in London, physically. And I was fortunate enough to have many of the executives of this myriad of standard setters and framework providers. And I said it was a social outrage that they saw themselves as competitors when they were dealing with, with issues which were for the public good. And... Um, they were all fishing from the same pond financially to be supported. And I'm told that sort of galvanized some thinking, but what really galvanized the thinking of these uh, standards of standard setters and framework providers, which were causing clutter and confusion for preparers and users, was the pandemic. Because under SDG 17 collaboration, these executives of these framework providers and standard setters saw how the scientists collaborated to create a vaccine in nine months instead of nine years. So the pandemic, as has been said often, don't lose the value of a good pandemic, um, a crisis. Um, it wasn't lost because suddenly there was collaboration. Like the collaboration David is talking about, financial reporting. We started seeing collaboration in the ESG space. And there was the statement of the group of five, the white paper was issued, collaboration of five major standard setters and framework providers. And then FRAC, the EC, started having a relook at its non-financial reporting directives. And the EU obviously is has got a legal framework. And they then developed their corporate sustainability reporting directives, which fits into their legal framework. And um, they're going to mandate that. But they are also looking at how those three critical dimensions, the economy, society, and the environment, impacts on the limited liability company, its financial condition, its balance sheet, its operating performance, its income statements, cash flow, its uh, risk profile, its cost of capital. So suddenly there was a realization that sustainability, like a coin, had two sides. And uh, it was not only how the company was impacting on these three critical dimensions of sustainable development, but how they were impacting on uh, the company and the two major events was the collapse of Lehman Brothers and I think it was 2008 and then uh, of course the GFC which interrupted harmonization on the financial reporting side and uh, really uh, through the ESG factors also into some chaos. So what has happened now is that the IFRS um, sent out a consultation paper towards the end of 2020 and asked, shouldn't they now expand the scope of their constitution and their powers from financial reporting to include sustainability reporting? There was an overwhelmingly positive response. And um, uh, since 2017, the IASB had been working on its management commentary which, as David knows, was issued many years ago as, um, and you know, Carol, uh, as an explanatory narrative on the financial statements by management. And, um, and it fitted in with the conceptual framework of the IASB standards. But uh, they started working on this at a time, 2017, until 
2020, when these framework uh, providers and standard setters were operating as if they were competitors. And suddenly, towards the end of 2020, they became collaborators. And um, so the exposure draft was issued by the IASB. The practice statement absolutely amended to include matters such as intangible resources, the relationships with stakeholders, and actually taking things out of the IR framework and putting it in the management commentary. And expressly saying this is management comments has got nothing to do with the board. And expressly stating they're not dealing with the G of ESG governance. Because, so they say that governance is different in each country. We must look at it. And then go on to say that they pleased that the IFRS is now going to establish, hopefully at the COP meeting, uh, in Glasgow, um, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which thinking is to issue global baseline standards or sustainability reporting. So that any other country, so you can take any country, take Belarus. Um, Belarus can have its own sustainability standards, but the what will happen in the capital markets of the world, the quality of those standards, I believe, will be measured against the global baseline standards of the ISSB. But the other critical question now um, is fragmentation, Carol. Um, we have um, a common vision, certainly David and I, and, uh, and uh, many, uh, I'm going to call us thought leaders in the space of corporate reporting, which is really the lifeblood of accountability. And that is to have a global comprehensive corporate reporting system. Unfortunately, although that's the vision, and I believe it's the end game, um, we are standing on the side of uh, a river and that river is flowing along with a lot of fragmentation of thinking, both in financial reporting and in the ESG space. And uh, so the drive to get harmonization on the ESG side, I think the fragmentation has started because the 27 states in the EU will be mandated to follow the CSRDs. And that embraces the double materiality concept that 50,000 companies in 27 states will have to report on both sides of that sustainability uh, coin that I've described. And um, at the moment, there seems to be a drive, and I, as David pointed out, was chair of the IRC, and we merged with SASB to create the Valley Reporting Foundation. And the talk now is, uh, and I say talk because there's nothing decided, everything is up in the air, is that um, the ISSB will really be looking at standards through the EVC lens, enterprise value creation lens. Yes, can I? So the can question I, can be asked is that really sustainability reporting? Exactly. I'm glad you got to that. But because I want to pick up on a couple of things, you have said, as I've heard the um, IFRIS Foundation trustees say, that there was an overwhelmingly positive response. There was a, a, a response to them doing something, but in reading the responses quite carefully, a lot of that was about them working with the other standard setters. That's what a lot of the responses were calling for. And um, there was a lot of concern about the um, audience that they were proposing, um, investors only, and also about the focus on um, enterprise value and financial materiality. And you've come to that question, is that really about sustainability? So there is a lot at stake here. Um, you know, we know that uh, climate change is, um, we've been issued a code red basically by the IPCC, as you will be uh, well aware. Um, 
and we know that there are a lot of problems in the, you know with the planet um, and biodiversity um, a lot of uh, human rights issues social issues and so on uh, so the stakes are really very high here and you know if i if i could put to you um mervyn if a company um understates the effects of pollution on uh, of the pollution incident on human health, for example, or is involved in human rights abuses, does that affect enterprise value? The answer, in my view, it does, because yes. I think I think what has happened: the civil society <clears throat> has replaced what was known as the shareholder activist. Um, civil society has become the activist of today and through social media can really communicate. Um, one of the most important uh, assets a company has is its reputation. If it does what you've just described, Carol, so let's try and be more specific. You have a, uh, a factory on uh, one of the great rivers of, uh, of the UK and it's discharging waste directly into that river. Um, well, that's going to impact hugely on, on, on its reputation and on value. So I've been advising companies for years to have an agenda item on their, on their boards of supply chain, that you have to have a supply chain code of conduct and you have to monitor what's happening with your service providers and your suppliers because if they are breaching human rights conventions for example employing child labor to reduce expenditure um, and that becomes known you could lose 40 percent of your market cap the next day on the london stock exchange so absolutely it's critical i think these things are critical to value and um, i don't want to speak for the iasb hans hochefust I know well and have a high regard for him at the time in 2017 when the ISB started working on amending its management commentary. Um, there was an understanding and an appreciation by Hans and his team that, uh, that there was a reason why we had this 80-20% uh, makeup of the market cap of companies. And you know, um, Ocean Terma did its final analysis in December 2020 on the S&P 500 and it came out to 10 and 90 percent and we know we've had this growth in ESG funds huge exponential growth and almost so, a financial <clears throat> capital funds. yeah so if I could come back to that point that the pollution incident uh, and the effect on human health and the human rights abuses have an impact on enterprise value, should, um, should we not really be looking at the impact of the organization on sustainable development and mandating that as a starting point? Because if organizations are not looking out for that, they're not engaging with their stakeholders, and therefore not aware of their impacts on society and the environment, how do they then get to those that are going to influence um, enterprise value? Yes. So disclosing my bias towards GRI reporting as the former chair, and um, the sustainability reporting was developed on a basis of looking at the activities of a company and how it made its product and when its product went out what was the impact and then after we formed uh, the uh, ir framework what was its impact on the six capitals which were an input into into the company so that was sustainability but as i said there's there's also an impact on these three critical dimensions on the balance sheet on the operating performance and the uh, cost of capital but these are financial issues and the question is which i ended when i was talking carolina you've raised it in some papers you've written is this really sustainability issues or are they really financial issues but this the csrds in in europe and the thinkers at the european commission is that this double materiality needs to be reported on and as I said earlier, um, 
we as directors owe our duty to the company. And that, that's clear. And um, therefore, we should be accountable to the company, through the company, to all the stakeholders. So we get, we get the duty, we get the accountability. And now how do we account? We account through reporting. And the question then starts arising, well, who is the audience of those reports? And um, my answer to that is, well, look at the risks and opportunities created by a certain event, such as pollution into a river. And uh, you can answer that question. When you, you can say that um, financial reporting, uh, the primary audience, the primary audience is the providers of capital, widely defined, to include creditors. But obviously, it's not exclusively the providers of capital, because nice. an employee can look at the financial reporting and vice versa. The mm. providers of capital are now looking in deciding whether to invest in a financial instrument of a company in the capital market for the world at the sustainability issues as reported through the GRI standards because it does impact on value. Yeah. Now, if I could bring um, David back in, you've both talked about the uh, management commentary practice um, statement. There's a new exposure draft out. It's been a very long time uh, coming. Um, we've talked about the audience for the front, front end of corporate reports being a mixture of investors and, and other stakeholders. Um, I, I'm keen to know your view on that management commentary uh, practice statement. Does it um, does it deal with some of the assets and liabilities that you feel are missing from the from the balance sheet, um, David and <clears throat> and Mervyn af after David? Um, is it an appropriate conceptual framework for the type of reporting that? you've just been talking about now to get to sustainability and sustainable development. Um, so, so David, first, does it, um, <clears throat> does it address um, some of the issues that you feel are missing from the, from the balance sheet um, adequately? Well, can I, can I say that uh, I thought what Mervyn has said and has been saying for the last 20 odd years it is absolutely spot on. Uh, there is so much at stake here. When you look at a company like Tesla, um, it had a market capitalization greater than that of Ford or um, General Motors. And we're talking two or three years ago, it only made a fraction of the number of cars. Uh, it was loss making. Uh, and yet there it was. So what, what's missing? And accounting is quite primitive. You know, when uh, Mervyn was talking about the, the assets we measure on the balance sheet are actually only a fraction of the what is really there. But yeah. the other thing I think is very important is um, the information that uh, Mervyn was talking about and is required, which I fully agree with. Unless we actually get that absolutely foremost in these things, people won't react. Now, just to give you an example, um, pensions. Uh, we made them put pension surplus deficits on balance sheet. Well, that went down like a rat sandwich. Uh, and the reason was previously the actuary said, oh, you've got to pay a million a year. And they just showed a million. And if they didn't pay a million, they showed either a prepayment for the extra or a accrual for the, the bit underneath. And you said, wait a minute, uh, you're showing a, a prepayment, which is an asset, but you've got a thumping great deficit sitting off balance sheet that isn't there. So we, we made them bring it in. And uh, the Americans didn't like it much because uh, they used to take this deficit, uh, knock 10% off whatever was the highest in the fund, either the liabilities, or the assets, and then spread it over the estimated working life of the um, employees. So you've got a, a tiny number compared to the deficit. And as I said to them, you may as well take that uh, deficit, divide it by the cube root of the number of miles to the moon and multiply it in mother's shoe size. I mean, it meant nothing. And you've got to have something that's absolutely there. And there was massive opposition. Uh, but what I found afterwards, uh, probably about three years afterwards, some of our greatest opponents came and said, you know, for the first time we're discussing pensions in the boardroom. And we're having to say to investors how we're going to deal with this. And the same way, uh, taking Mervyn's example of the river, uh, if a company... Uh, said that you know we're, we're dumping all these tons of waste into the river and if we had a standard saying and this is how you cost the effect of society 
if you have that up front, then you'll start seeing governance, you'll start seeing governments taking action, you'll start seeing uh, civil society taking action. That'll knock down their um, enterprise value. But at the moment, it's not there. You, you, it's hidden. Uh, and you've got to bring it right up front. Uh, and that's what I, I think is one of the problems. You'll have opposition. Uh, they'll probably want you to, to issue uh, another exposure draft or have field tests and uh, hearings. And then if that doesn't work, they'll run to governments and ask them to put pressure on you. And one of the issues you're going to have is, uh, I remember having with the French government, um, and uh, I had quite a few issues with the French government. They used to say that um, when I went to France, I was treated like a king, and you know how they treat their kings. And it was a case that they would object to say, you know, you guys are sitting out there issuing standards, which you want our companies to do. We have to change company law through parliament. You're an extra parliamentary body issuing these standards. So you've got to take these guys with you. And, uh, but I think you're in a, a terrific position because there's no doubt about it. It's an absolute, it's not just a groundswell. It's much more than that. Now it's a tide that's coming in to sort of say these things really matter. And the issues that Mervyn has campaigned for for years and years and years, here's the time. Here it's coming. But, you know, I, I think having a sort of discussion isn't enough. We need something right up front. Uh, a bit tougher than this. Um, when I was at the ISB, frankly, we didn't have time to do this. First, we had to clean up the standards we inherited. Secondly, we we're trying to get the US on board. We're in a different era now. and uh, This is where it really matters. So this is the time for it. And uh, I think there are a lot of uh, issues to be dealt with, but um, Mervyn hit the nail right in the head. This is what's got to happen. It's not just uh, financial reporting in the sense of capital markets reporting. These are issues that will affect the capital markets, and at the moment, they're hidden. But um, the issue is, how do we make them not hidden? And the concern is that if we focus only on those that companies think are going to affect their value, or um, uh, then we're going to be missing out on the ones that are going to matter in the longer term. Um, which they don't immediately see are going to affect affect their value. You know, there is a saying that there are no profits on a dead planet. And um, we're, we're looking to change behavior, um, which has been very motivated by, by profit. If you, as you've said, David, there's been a lot of bad behavior and profit management. And that is also going on in, you know, when corporations are working out what they're going to do about sustainability issues and social and environmental issues. So that, you know, there really is a, a question around how do we address this in a way that is um, going to lead to um, a better planet and you know, better social environment because, you know, when I talk to company directors in South Africa and they had started thinking about some of these issues because of integrated reporting, which Mervyn championed there, they were talking about how poverty and inequality um, was a great concern to them because it might lead to civil unrest, that might prevent foreign investment coming into the country and um, so therefore that was an issue um, for enterprise value and you know if we are only if we ask board directors and management to only think about enterprise value or to think about that from a starting point my concern is that we're not going to get to either a good place with enterprise value or in terms of sustainable development. And that brings me back to you, Mervyn, um, and your, your view on the um, uh, management commentary practice statement, the focus on enterprise value and cash flows and what matters in terms of enterprise value and cash flows. Is that enough for what needs to go up front in a corporate report? Could, could I just... No, but, uh, sorry, 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 David. David. One, one thing I was going to say is you're, you're emphasising management commentary quite a lot, but mm -hmm. there's a new board coming. What's that board going to do? And this is where I think the key is. Who's going to chair this? What sort of person is he? Is he going to be a toady? 
Or, or is he going to be someone who says, you know, I'm going to bring in these bodies that we've got already, the Sustainability Board, the Integrated uh, Reporting Board. I want representation, representation on my board from these bodies. They're the ones that should be pushing it. Uh, and that it would be nice. Yes, well, it we, would did be. That, we did that with ISB. If you look at the yeah. ISB, it consisted of members from all the major standard setters. And they were in. And that changed the dynamics. And you can't just have management saying this is what we, should, we want to do or accept this is what we will do. You want people who are going to stir it up. And okay. Good, good, good point. I'm hoping that the chair might be a she, by the way. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion. It will be a he. But, but Mervyn, on the question of we've, we've got a management commentary exposure draft just now. Um, and if, as David suggests, an ISSB might come in and um, ask that that be changed, we've been asked to provide feedback on it, on it as it is now. How would you like to see it change? Well, first of all, I think there's some fatal flaws in the management practice statement as an exposure draft at the moment. First of all, um, based on the conceptual framework of the financial reporting standards, there's a complete mismatch. And uh, if you look at um, the most important body of persons in deciding what is material in the sense of significantly impacting on value, in a financial report or a sustainability report, it's the board. And the board is expressly excluded um, in the financial statement or by its very name, management commentary. And uh, the board is essential on enterprise value creation because the board finalizes the business model, finalizes what SDGs embraced in that business model, finalizes how the, how the company functions, its activities and finalizes GRC issues, governance, risk and compliance. They have oversight and final approval. And to say expressly that this is management comment, it's got nothing to do with the board, as it does say in the ED. Um, well, directors can delegate, but they can't um, abdicate their responsibilities. So when something goes wrong, and something will go wrong, it always does, the directors are going to be liable. So. The management commentary, I think, is um, a document that concerns me because they also it was issued, they worked in it at a time when there wasn't this collaborative uh, context. And also they, it was issued, launched for commentary after the IFRS said, well, we're now going to expand our mandate to include sustainability issues. And so they say in the exposure draft, well, that's wonderful because now we can have interaction between the management comments and the ISSB global baseline standards. Well, there won't be interaction. There'll be duplication. That, 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 that's what's going to happen. And exactly what we try to do is to eliminate uh, duplicated reporting and, um, and get rid of clutter and confusion. I think it will cause clutter and confusion. And in any event, um, the IR framework and one of the principles of all of the task teams in this ESG space is we're not going to reinvent wheels, exactly what David has been saying. And not because I'm founder chair of the IRC, but, but the IR framework has had 10 years of work and it's starting to develop a rigor and resilience and consistency around the world. And... What is also common cause amongst these task teams that are working at the moment is that there has to be, I use the word of the European accountancy, of connection between the financial and the so-called non-financial. And the best body of persons to do this connection, or as I call it, integrated, is, um, is the board itself and not management. In any event, the board has an oversight over management. And so I think the, uh, the management commentary at a time, the thinking was good, but the timing is also unfortunate now because now you've got the exposure drop issued at a time when the ISSB is developing, is developing global baseline standards. And I think there are some global baseline sustainability issues in that management commentary, which is inconsistent with the conceptual framework. So there are a whole host of issues and I think um, 
uh, it's become a distraction for those mm. in the in the task teams working on hopefully to get this harmonization in the sustainability ESG arena. And of course, the um, conceptual framework in the management commentary that you've just expressed concern about is is the one that the IFRS Foundation um, trustees have set for the ISSB. Um, and so um, I presume you'd have a similar concern then about you've asked, you've already raised the question about is it sustainability then? What would you like to see happen? in terms of the conceptual thinking that brings in um, the sustainability uh, reporting side? Well, uh, um, I think the IR framework is a conceptual framework. If you think about it, I mean, it's, a, it's an overarching framework which brings together the financial and all the values that are not expressed as additives on a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards. It brings it together and, and you've got the most important body of persons that actually understand, should spend more time understanding the financials and the so-called non-financials and then report on those matters, not in IFRA speak or ISSB speak, which will also be technical, such as ecological overshoot and language like that. And so, but in clear, concise and understandable language so that the user can really make an informed judgment call on the long-term health of the company because if the board gets that right it's in the long-term interest of all the stakeholders and that's why this question of audience is one that really perturbs me um you can say that the financial statements the primary audience is the providers of capital but you, that you can't say it is for the providers of capital it's um it's the same as you can't say the, the, the sustainability report this is for civil society and employees uh, providers of capital shouldn't they be looking at the sustainability report well, of course they should and that's why it's common cause amongst all these people that these things need to be connected need to be integrated and they are integrated 24 7 and it, it was said by Brunton in 1987 and that's why I remember at the United Nations in having a discussion with Gordon Lidstrom, uh, who was then president of IFAC, when there was great concern uh, of this 80-20 in the makeup of market cap of companies. And it was clear that we as directors in doing an annual report, which was consistent only of the AFS according to IFRS standards in this part of the world, um, we weren't discharging our duty of accountability. And so... The GRI was born to try and give some guidelines and our standards on the so-called 80% of value. But what we are trying to do now is try to harmonize these things, both financial and so-called non-financial phrase I don't like because they will have financial outcomes eventually. But um, so, yes, harmonization is a battle that continues, David. It hasn't stopped. And so, um, you know, not, not. I, I, I mean, clearly, it is a good time, and and the the various bodies involved, which are global, by the way. It's not like what David had to deal with, where there were different practices in different countries. I mean, in Europe alone, there was there were so many different um, practices in terms of financial uh, reporting. Um, that was a that was a massive task. What we do, what we have now, are global uh, bodies. So it's about that getting the conceptual thinking right. I think uh, to to bring them to bring them together. Um, so before I pass back to um, Anne, I'm going to give um, David the last word on that um, conceptual thinking. Not not to tell us what it should be, but how do you ha, what advice would you give what's your, your parting advice on how we can get to developing a conceptual thinking that actually um is going to bring these bodies together and bring the various ideas together so that you've got a report which works for um investors and stakeholders because after all what matters to um stakeholders in the end is going to impact on investors <laughs> Well, I, I think, as I said earlier, the, the important thing is, what is the, the locus of the sustainability board that's coming out? 
it produces a standard. Now what? What's going to happen to that standard? Who's going to make it mandatory? And if you have something as we did, uh, we got off to a flying start at IESB because the European Commission decided that companies in Europe, um, listed companies, were going to have to use I4S. And it was obvious why they were going to do it, because it would probably take them 10 years to produce their own standards. Uh, you could either take the American standards, well, that go down very well in France. And similarly with the British standards, that was a nod on. So the international standards were the obvious ones. But once they did it, you suddenly saw what happened. You've got Australia and New Zealand saying, well, we'll do it too. Then there's Hong Kong and suddenly it starts to spread. And then Latin America comes in and then Canada comes in and yeah. they start to, to do this. So I, I think it's getting governments on board. How is this sustainability standard going to relate to IFRS? Is it going to be mandatory? Now, that's risky for ISB because if they say you've got to obey these and a certain country says, no, we're not, you're not complying with IFRS after that. So the numbers start dropping. So that's going to be an issue. We had the same with the International Valuation Standards Council. You know, a lot of the problems in the global financial crisis were valuation. Accountants aren't great valuers. We're not trained to do that. Uh, we've got to bring that in as well. And you've got the issue, certainly, of intangibles. But I think there's a hidden, these are assets, but they're hidden liabilities. And it's the liability you do by dumping stuff into the river. How do we measure that? Uh, and once you get government saying, um, we need this, uh, and we're going to start regulating, boy, there's a liability coming up very, very rapidly, a real financial liability, and you'll get it. So I think the answer is we've got to get find out what's the status and the locus of the uh, sustainability board relative to IFRS. Secondly, how do we get governments to say this matters and we're behind it? Uh, and that's a key thing. This COP conference is going to be so, so important uh, of getting this going. But so are the people on that board. Uh, and I firmly believe we need people from the organizations that uh, already exist. And you know, I was delighted when Mervyn said at his speech in uh, 2019, exactly what was necessary. If they splinter, you've had it. It'll never happen. We want yes. them together and on board and get government backing. And then you're on. The, to get government backing, though, I think they're going to have to think a bit more than just about enterprise value because oh, no. governments are not just concerned about enterprise value. No. I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. It's not the be all and end all. It's important, but so is the way that we're destroying the planet. Good way to, to finish and to bring back and back in on that point and to see what questions the audience have for us. Thank you both. Well, thanks, thanks to all of you for that that incredibly um, insightful and, and honest um, and fascinating conversation. And just you know, the, the, a couple of things that just stood out for me is is that you know, to, to David's point, is that the, the time is right. This is this is the time to actually start tackling this. Everything is aligned. We've got societal shifts. Um, we've got the science to back it up and there seems to be an appetite within governments and, and, and standard setters to address it. So let's work together to Mervyn's point, collaborate and, and, and make this, this work and, and a success because that's all, the ultimate goal is, is to um, do what's in the best interest of, of society um, and, and for the, the planet. So we have had a, a couple of questions or a few questions come in and I would encourage the audience to share any any questions or burning issues that they have um, on the, the Q&A button at the, the, the bottom of your screen. Um, but if I could first, and this is probably one for possibly um, Carol and, and Mervyn, um, and would you agree that the main purpose of sustainability reporting is to inform impact investing and consumer choices? And if so, is that really enough to drive the scale of change that is required? And do you ever see a scenario where sustainability reporting could be the basis for a, a, a carbon um, usage tax and, and should, would such a tax be desirable and, and effective? So quite a few elements to that, but just to summarize the purpose of sustainability reporting, is it to in, inform impact investing and 
is that sufficient and could we have a, a carbon usage tax um, based on sustainability reports? Mervyn and, and Carol, I don't know if, if one of you wants to come in first on that point. Well, I'll, I'll have a shot and then Carol can follow. Um, none of these issues can be seen or should be considered in isolation. They're absolutely connected and they are, in my view, integrated. So the question of impact investing is really looking at, at the long-term health of the company. Um, if David, Carol and I and you, Anne, are the trustees of a pension fund in Scotland, we, are, we have a duty to those beneficiaries to make sure we're investing in the equity of a company that we believe has got long-term health because actually we have to pay out for this person 27 years time. Um, so we've got to make sure that they have a business model which is sustainable in a resource constrained world. So we have to look as uh, the Norwegian oil fund and BlackRock does in the capital markets of the world. When a company issues a bond today with a certain coupon, they don't, they do a financial due diligence, of course, but they do an ESG due diligence as well. And they ask questions such as, do you have a, do you have a, um, a sustainable, uh, conduct in your in your supply chain you know what's happening in your supply chain what's what is what are your outputs well of course there's waste what happens to your waste what do you do all these things are taken into account before making the decision to discharge your duty to your beneficiaries that you're actually investing in a company where the board has applied its mind to the long-term health of the company so for example the four of us are directors of a, five of us are directors in a company in uh, the EU. Um, we should, if we, our plant machinery is fossil fuel driven, we should start changing that to renewables. Uh, how do you do that? We've got a debt equity ratio, it looks fine. And uh, we've got our balance sheet, we've borrowed, let's say uh, 10 million pounds from, from a bank. Well, the bank looks at our balance sheet, starts looking one of our major assets is a plant and machinery which is reducing in value because uh, it's driven by fossil fuel and could become a stranded asset. So we need to fix it up. So we make a decision in the long-term best interest of the company just to not pay dividends for three years, to use that cash to change from fossil fuels to renewables. Now, some companies have done exactly that. One would expect the share price to go down, but in some cases, the share price has gone up because companies like BlackRock have said, here yeah, is a board that's actually applied its mind to the long-term health of this company. And that's what I need to invest in. So you've got to, from an impact investing point of view, you can't isolate sustainability reporting from the financial report or vice versa or any other. As I said, the reports that the boards make are the lifeblood of accountability. If you're going to be accountable, the content of the reports is critical. And then you start looking at audiences. And to me, to say that the, the audience for a financial report is the provider of financial capital is, is not correct. You can say it's the primary audience. That I don't mind. But, but I believe the, the employee and everybody will look at a balance sheet and try and gain some knowledge from it. And that's why these things have to be user-friendly as well. So uh, I think the phrase clear, concise, and understandable reporting, and that's where you capture it in the integrated report. Thank, thank you for that, that Mervyn. That's, that's helpful. Carol, is there anything that you would like to, to add to what Mervyn has yes, said? So, so briefly, I think the starting point has to be reporting on the impacts of the organization on sustainable development and the process that organizations go through to identify those impacts. That process is important because at the end of the day, what we want to do is change. We're talking about a massive transformation. Uh, within organizations away from the profit, um, the profit motive. That has to be the starting point to then be able to identify the risks and opportunities that will affect enterprise value. 
And um, we need organizations to really identify those risks and to incorporate them into strategy um, to create value. So we need them also to report on that strategy and how they have um, identified those risks and opportunities, what governance oversight they have over that, and the integration of those with the strategy in, in order that the organization is um, producing products or services that are compatible with sustainable development. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. David, is there anything that you want to add to what Carol or, or Mervyn have, have said in response to, to that specific oh, I, question? I fully agree. Absolutely agree. Great. And just moving on to the next question, Carol, you were talking about risks there, and I, I would like to, to bring David in to, to this particular question. And do you think that the risks associate, associated with climate change are priced into the financial markets? Um, and, and if not, is mark-to-market um, accounting an appropriate basis for reporting on the value of, of financial assets? So are we currently pricing climate change into our, our balance sheets? Uh, partially. Um, I, I think some of them are. But then there's a question, how much information have they got? Uh, at the moment, they're looking at it on a sort of global basis. Um, the information that Mervyn just talked about would actually refine what they would be looking at. So I, I think the real problem is that uh, they think, well, this is, you know, using a lot of uh, coal, etc. That's a bad thing. They're going to have to change. That's going to be various costs, etc., etc. That's fine. Uh, but uh, if they haven't got the information, and the one that uh, always has bothered me is the waste issue. Uh, that Mervyn went on. 30 odd years ago, I remember there was a report into the Avon Rubber Company, but it was actually, it come because uh, ladies that uh, lived next to the factory were fed up getting smuts all over their washing and saying, well, why are we having to deal with all this? This is your problem. You're causing this. It's our cost and your problem. Well, that was right at the beginning of this issue. But now you see the state of rivers, you see all the plastics that are dumped, uh, we really have to get much better than this. Uh, and that's why I really hope this uh, board that we're talking about uh, setting up uh, are fe fe fiercely um, warrior types, uh, want to get it done, uh, are integrated with all the things that Mervyn talked about. And uh, I was really so pleased to see that happen because that was an essential part of getting this thing done. Then we can go places. So I think you know, to talk about fair value accounting, I, I'd suddenly sort of find that everyone is shouting about, yes, fair value accounting is the answer to accounting in the long run. And we're nowhere near there. We've got so many things, as I said, missing off the balance sheet. People think in terms of assets. You know, the International Valuation Standards Council, they're the valuers. We don't use them, but we should and bring them into the IFRS as well. But the issue is they're looking at assets. I think the things we've got to start looking at are the hidden liabilities that society picks up, which should come back to the company. Yeah. And and we'll come back to the company in the longer term. Um, Maybe. So, yeah. <laughs> any other any other comments um, from Carol or, or Mervyn on that particular point? Or no, shall just, I, I, I want to echo what David has said. It's the hidden yeah, liabilities, which is a great concern. Because um, we know the 20th century was a century of unsustainable development and that the bottom lines of, I'm going to say most companies, were subsidized by society and the environment. And we just can't, cannot continue like that because the company was created by society for society. It's, it's the most important citizen in the developed and developing world because it's a platform for raising capital, for creating jobs, etc. But it's got to be done in a sustainable manner in our resource-constrained world. And uh, and as directors, as corporate leaders, we have to be accountable. And how do we account? We report. And so we have to start looking for what David has called hidden liabilities, absolutely. And it's a matter that concerns me as well. And uh, will the ISSB Global Baseline Standards even cover that question of hidden liabilities? Yeah. The answer, I think, is no. And that that's of concern. And then yes. what is 
really worrying is fragmentation because we tried to harmonize and we already have fragmentation of 27 states in the EU because they're going to follow the CSRD, which is adopting an objective assessment in their reports of the double materiality concept. So, and the ISSB, as I understand the, the talks that are happening, is focusing on enterprise value creation lens. And, uh, well, then what are you going to have a separate sustainability report for activities and impacts of the product itself in society and the environment? Uh, the answer is you could end up, land up with more reports than we have now. So um, it's, it's a matter of concern and uh, it's a matter for further debate. So coming on well, those points, yeah. Well, I just wanted to, to say at the end, the EU did do a very thorough um, research and consultation exercise in arriving at their proposals. The um, IFRIS trustees, IFRIS foundation trustees, to my mind, looked at a, a subset of these stakeholders that were concerned and put out proposals before doing a wider consultation about the approach. And to my mind, that is that was that was a wrong move, and that has that has had um, some consequences in getting people um, offside. All the responses they got that said, "Yes, do it," but you have to talk to them. You have to um, think about um, a broader audience and investors, and you have to have a different definition of materiality. There were a lot of um, responses along those lines. Thanks, everyone. I, I, I'm just looking at another question that, that's come up, and, and this is around the, the actual presentation of, of the information and a question about whether in our, our digital age there will ever there will never be just one single report. And this implies that the IFRS Foundation or IESB is is bound to deliver some form of expanded annual report with sustainability elements added. But the GRI network will continue to really shape the future of sustainability reporting that speaks to a, a, a wider audience and, and stakeholder um, audience. So is, is there a, a danger that um, we're focusing too much on this idea of one single report? Um, and actually, there, there is a, a need to um, think about the, the way that it's presented and, and if you like, a, a, a network or, or some, some system of, of connected reports. And maybe that speaks to, to you, Mervyn, and, and Carol, based on, on your, your previous experience with the IIRC. Well, um, I don't think you can have one... One comprehensive. When we talk about uh, a comprehensive corporate reporting system globally, uh, my vision certainly is you're going to have financial reporting, you're going to have sustainability reporting in true ESG, bringing in hidden liabilities and all the things we've been talking about. And But the critical issue, I think, is in the integration at the top. And uh, the board applies its mind to that and and spends more time understanding the financials. And interesting research done in London about five, seven, eight years ago, maybe, that up to 30% of directors don't understand the financial statements. But inversely, 70% of directors don't bother to even read the sustainability reports. So quite extraordinary uh, when you think about that. So you need the board to absolutely apply its mind to these issues and understand the issues and understand from a materiality point of view what is, has significant impact on value. And then connect the two because you need to connect them because the assets and liabilities, certain assets and liabilities, as we've discussed, are not included on a balance sheet and uh, they are... To use, I'm going to repeat David's words, they're hidden. <laughs> they are hidden. And uh, we need to find a, a method of disclosure because to be truly accountable to disclose that. So that and, and in a language that the user can actually make an informed assessment. 
And we mustn't forget the users are not Mervyn, David, and Carol, and Anne. Sometimes they're ordinary people living in Edinburgh who die and leave for their auntie or an uncle as the executives, for example. And these people have to understand they're going to now invest 10 million pounds, which the deceased has left for the beneficiaries. And they might have an asset manager, but do they interrogate the asset manager properly? What mandate do they give the asset manager? So all these things are absolutely critical. And the capital markets of the world, I think, are starting to slowly, slowly improve matters. And I agree with David. I think we now in a, a stage on planet Earth where there is starting to be an appreciation that maybe we won't have a habitable planet by the end of the century. And that's one of the drivers for writing my book, Chief Value Officer, in 2016 where I said that really the accountant doesn't just sit in his or her corner office drafting an AFS according to IASB standards. Um, they, they are applying their minds and they've been trained in this in thinking about these issues. They are, they're looking at the whole value creation process from inputs to outcomes. So it's a whole change of mindset of the accounting profession and IFAC agrees. It's absolutely agreed with that. And uh, so we've got great universities in the world now launching CVO MBAs and teaching the value creation thinking in accountancy to accountancy students. So integrated thinking and all these uh, concepts are now being taught. And it's not for accountants just to start learning this on the job, as it were, to use a colloquialism. But they are being taught this, and hence my starting the Good Governance Academy, because I want thought leaders to come and talk. So you educate the educators to make sure they're educating these young people correctly, because we need that generation. People ask me about diversity on boards, about gender and race, but what about intergenerational diversity? If you have boards consisting of people like David and me, we're very experienced. But you go and get a millennial or a Generation Z, and I tell you something, you talk to them, you get a light bulb experience. They will think of something that you haven't thought of. It comes from the left field, and, it, and you, then you've got to think about it to make that judgment call in the best long-term interest of the health of the company. So yeah. intergenerational diversity is absolutely critical in this tide that's happening. Yeah, and, and we do see how... how that that younger generation are actually driving a lot of this agenda as as well through through their act. Carol, was there anything briefly that you wanted to add before I I move on to probably what will be our final question? Just very briefly, I wouldn't like to see accountants try and do all of this on their own. Accountants need to be talking to sustainability experts. We need sustainability experts involved in setting sustainability uh, standards. Um, and, and coming back to the question about can we put it all in one report? Well, I don't think anybody is doing that, and I don't think that's desirable. Um, the companies are disclosing information in, in different places. That's what I like about the GRI index. You can put some of it in the annual report, some of it on the website, some of it in a sustainability report, and just say where it all is um, in, the, in the content index. Um, so I, I don't think we should be aiming for, um, for one report with everything in it. Thank, thanks, Carol. If I can just move on to what will probably be our, our final question, and um, I would like to ask each of you, probably starting with um, David. So if we do look ahead five years into the future, do you think it will be possible to have one recognised global standard setter on sustainability reporting standards and probably drawing on your own experience, David, from a financial perspective when you, you consider that, that question? Uh, it could be. Um, I, I think a lot depends on the composition of the, the board that we're talking about setting up. Uh, I think a lot depends on whether all the organisations fire in. I couldn't agree more. This is not something that accountants are particularly skilled in, uh, and therefore you need to draw on all the expertise of the Integrated Reporting Council and so on. Uh, bring them in. Uh, we want Mervyn as a trustee of the uh, IFRS Foundation. Uh, that's the sort of 
somebody in there to start causing problems. And sorry, Mervyn, but you know what I mean. It's just a case of stirring it up. So you don't want a lot of old accountants deciding how we deal with uh, sustainability. We actually need people who know all about it to get in there. I think one of the key things I think is so important is how do we get the, the main products uh, of these uh, groups, such as we're talking about these hidden liabilities and things, up front and foremost? And it does matter. If it's right there, people, including directors, pay attention because other people are asking them questions. And it was the same with pensions. What are you going to do about this deficit? Oh, well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. So what are you going to do about this waste that you're chucking at the river? Oh, we're going to do... Uh, and that's where I think it, it matters. We have to get these things right up front. Experts agreed how we measure it, agree how we show it in the uh, accounts. And I, I do agree that we may have a specialist sustainability report, but the key features must be in the annual report and very prominent. David, Carol? Final thought um, from you. Uh, final thought from me. Um, can you go to Mervyn first? Sorry, yes, I'm of course, course Mervyn. The final thought from me is that um, you have in your management team a chief value officer who really looks at this value creation process and looks at this both sides of the sustainability coin. And underneath him or her, you have a chief financial director and you have a chief sustainability director. And then inside the company, internally, you've actually got this marriage of hidden values and hidden liabilities being discussed. And when the CVO goes to the board, he can really, he is the true change maker in the board. And he or she does not have to be an accountant. Uh, they can be someone with an MBA, so a major bank um, in South Africa, Standard Bank uh, from Standard Charter, um, has a CVO, and underneath him he's got a CA who is the Chief Financial Director, and underneath he's got a Chief Sustainability Director to make sure the bank doesn't start financing, um, let's say, a new coal mine or whatever it is, and that would hit uh, the reputation of the bank and... Uh, yeah, so, so, so some, someone that holds to account. Actually, actually build that into your governance structure. Mm. It starts seeking through into your business model and everything and then into report. So, Can I, so five years from now, I see financial reporting and environmental and social issues being reported on. But then the critical issue is going to be in how you connect those two and actually explain it so that even the uninformed can make informed judgment calls about the longevity of the company. I think we'll only, have, we'll only have one set of standards in five years if the conceptual framing changes, because at the moment, what the ISSB is proposing is yet another um, different approach um, uh, put into the works um, rather than rather than harmonizing and bringing them all together so that conceptual framing needs to change okay thank you carol um and on on that final note i i'm afraid i am going to have to wrap up this this discussion it's um been a fascinating one and one that will go on and, and continue and um icas will continue to to help influence and, and shape the, the ongoing debate um, that, that's taking place at within the IFRS Foundation. So if I can just thank all of, all of the speakers today for taking the time to share their thoughts and their in, insights and their honesty and a lot to take away from this um, and just reflect upon. Thank you too to your, to your audience and for submitting your questions and, and for joining us today. I hope you find it all insightful and helpful as you think about your own approach to sustainability reporting standards. The next big ICAS event taking place will be the CA Summit and I would encourage you all to attend. It's being held over three afternoons on the 5th, 6th and 7th of October. We have a great ex and exciting lineup of speakers coming together to talk about a wide range of topics, including sustainability. So do have a look at the ICAS website to find out more and register for your place. And we hope to see some of you then. A final request from me before you go, um, if you could please launch the survey, uh, complete the survey, which will launch 
after the webinar closes to give us your feedback and comments. So finally, all that's left for me is to thank all of you, including our speakers, and enjoy the rest of your day, evening, and have a very enjoyable weekend. Thank you, David.